Testing. Testing, testing. Okay, the camera's blurring out. Um, today is probably the hardest lecture of the entire <laughs> of the entire um, semester, actually, because I kind of did some bad scheduling and I scheduled two of the hardest lectures on the same day. So today's lectures are going to be, um, unfortunately, uh, a little difficult. Uh, and I won't be able to even asking any homework questions on them. I won't even be asking any homework questions on them. But um, it's important that you know what we're doing, um, like technique-wise. So the first half, we're going to show finish the proof of equivalence between pushdown automata and context-free grammars. And the second half, we're going to prove that there exist languages which are not producible by context-free grammars. So uh, last time, we showed what? We showed that we given a okay. I'll just use a different mark. This one's a brand new marker, though, so I had hopes for it. Boy, card expo. Yeah. <laughs> I just took it from the, from the lounge. That was not going to work. Okay. Start with that one. Um, so last time, we, we basically, so like, what is a, uh, we showed how to convert a context-free grammar into a PDA. Right. So given a context-free grammar, we were able to convert it into a PDA and such that the PDA produced, excuse me, the PDA was able to decide strings on only the strings that could have been produced by the context-free grammar. And this was relatively easy because a PDA is a program, a kind of restricted program, and a CFG is a device. It's a producing device. So given a device, uh, you can write a program for it. That's kind of easy and intuitive. So today, we're going to finish the proof with the harder direction. We're going to, given a PDA, we're going to create a CFG uh, such that the CFG uh, produces only the strings that the PDA would decide. Now, that is not obvious how you do that. That is not easy sounding because a PDA is a kind of a program and a CFG is a, is a producing device. So the PDA is kind of easy, like, how does it work? You go left to right through the string. The grammars go inside out. They go like a flower, right? So it's not obvious how you would even do this. How would you even, quote unquote, program a CFG to perform the simulation of a PDA? So this is really, really, um, uh, this direction is slightly more involved of a proof. And it's not obvious about how, how, to, how to even begin. Um, but we're going to do it. We're going to be able to, and, and by doing these two things, we're, we'll be able to prove that the PDAs and the CFGs decide exactly the same class of languages. So they have equivalent power. And once you finish with that, you can just say, you know, if a language is context-free, then you know they're either, you can either say there exists a PDA for it or there exists a CFG, whichever one is more convenient uh, at the time for you. So in order to do this, uh, the CFG is kind of more delicate than the PDA. So we need to restrict the kind of forms that we want our PDA to look like to make this more, uh, to make this uh, simulation work. So first, we're going to make uh, the PDA a P, uh, quote unquote, nice. And we're going to do the following things to make it nice. So PDA, P is, a, is, is some PDA. We're going to try and create, create a grammar G, such that if a string is accepted by PDA P, then the grammar has to produce it. That's the goal here. First, we're going to convert P into something that what we call is, is, is nice. So one, a P has one accept state. Right? A PDA can have many accept states. That's more than fine. But how would we do this to make it? We're going to convert the PDA P so it only has one accept state in a way that doesn't change the kind of strings it accepts. This trick actually works for NFAs as well. But if you have like a, like a PDA that looks like this, say it has two accept states, something like this, what you can do is add a new accept state and then just epsilon transition to it. Remove these as accept states 
and make that the accept state, right? Congrats, we now have one accept state. So now the PDA has one start and the PDA has one end. So we're done uh, with that part. So we make the PDA have exactly one accept state. Uh, two, uh, P accepts only with an empty stack. We want it to begin with an empty stack and we want it to end with an empty stack. The way we're going to do this, the way we modify the PDA to do this is we're going to make sure that uh, we apply the convention that we've already done anyway. PDAs are more general than the ones we've shown by examples. We, you know, every example we gave started with pushing a dollar sign, pushing the canary, and then popping the canary because it was useful for us to test. All the languages we wanted to decide required us testing if the stack was empty. That was like conditional on uh, the problems we were trying to solve with the stack. PDAs, though, are more general. They, they can do as many complicated things as interface or DFAs. Uh, with lots of crossing over, not look so straight line. So you can have a uh, PDA do many, many ugly things. Instead, we're going to modify it. So always, the way we're going to have this work is going to make sure that it only accepts uh, when the stack is empty. The way you do this is you start by pushing the canary, dump the stack, and then pop the canary. Like, um, make sure you begin with uh, pushing. Uh, the canary, if accept, you, you, you're going to dump, dump the stack, and then pop the canary. That's the modification you're going to do. So normally, if you had a normal accept state, now you add a new accept state, uh, but from your old accept state, you have a self-loop where you dump, all, you dump the stack, and then you make this transition. And then three, finally, every transition will uh, push or pop, but not both. So we, just to simplify things, a transition, recall, is going to like um, read A off the input, uh, pop B, and then push C, something like this. Um, so it reads A, pops B, pushes C. Right. Uh, this does three things in one step. We want to modify it um, so that it does uh, only one of those things. This is really the main step. Um, again, we're applying these guarantees. So when we convert the PDA into a CFG, uh, this really allows us to do it. This is really, you know, again, like I said, the CFG is more delicate than the PDA. Um, and we need to have, make sure the PDA has this kind of structure for the C CFG to be able to perform the simulation. So it, the, the, this is not too hard to prove yourself, but if you can pop B and then push C in one transition, you certainly can pop in one transition and then push in another transition. So the way you're going to do this is just add a dummy state. Read AF the input, uh, pop B, push nothing, read nothing off the input, pop nothing, push C. Right, so we added a dummy state there. If you have a transition that pops B, pushes C, add a dummy state. Now you have two transitions, one that pops B, one that pushes C. Right. Awesome. So um, the high-level idea of the simulation uh, is actually not too hard. So the proof is quite technical and involved. I've been hyping it up. But the actual idea is not, is not, too, is not too tricky. Uh, so like... Uh, for each pair of states, uh, like let's call it P, Q, in, Q and Q, uh, the non-terminal uh, A uh, PQ uh, will produce all strings uh, to bring PDA from state P with empty stack 
a two uh, state Q with empty stack. So uh, APQ is going to be a non-terminal. Recall that a grammar has a recursive structure. So each non-terminal produces something. And we consider what the grammar produces by whatever the start state produces. So APQ is some intermediate non-terminal, and it produces some set of strings. We want it to produce the exact set of strings that will bring the PDA from state P to state Q. Then, uh, if that's true, then A0F uh, uh, produces all of the language uh, produced by our PDA. So P, the language uh, excuse me, the language decided by our PDA is going to be some set of strings. Uh, 0F is like the start state and the, and the single final state. And A0F is going to be our start state. It's going to produce, if we can recursively define APQ in this way, then we can just set the start state to be A0F. And that's going to be all uh, the strings. Why? Because all the strings that can bring a PDA from the start state to the end state to the final state are exactly the strings which are accepted by the PDA. So A0F is going to produce all the strings that bring it, but they bring the PDA from the start state to the final state. So it's going to produce all the strings that the PDA accepts. Right? And that's the high level idea behind uh, um, Uh, this this proof. So we can understand the recursive. We can then we can understand the relationship between the non-terminals. Uh, then we can understand the relationship between the way the PDA works, and that that recursive argument gives us basically basically the whole thing. So like um, let's consider like an intermediary computation path from all ways you can go in a PDA from some state P to some state Q, like. Um, Uh, if you go uh, from P, and I'm going to use this abbreviation ES for empty stack, because uh, I don't want to keep writing empty stack. So if you go from state P with an empty stack to Q with an empty stack, um, and the stack was never empty, in between, the last symbol popped was the first one pushed. So suppose you consider a computation that goes from state P to state Q. You start with an empty stack and you end with an empty stack. That means and if the stack was never empty to enter in any intermediary point, what that means is that the first symbol pushed had to be the last symbol popped. Does that seem appropriate? So like as a, under this assumption, this is like a, maybe the stack height. Like it goes maybe you push, pop, push, pop, whatever, right? But the stack is never empty, right? So consider this like the stack depth. Whatever the first thing that is pushed is going to be the last thing that is popped. Right, because everything else is just pushing, 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 popping those off. But the first thing pushed has to be the last thing popped. So what that means is in our, and this is a one case. We're going to do the, the other case in a second where if there was, if the stack was empty, um, basically then our PDA has this structure. Suppose the first symbol we read off the input was an A. Um, uh, we popped nothing. We popped nothing, and we push some symbol U. Let's just call it U, OK? So we read, nothing off, we read A off the input. We pop nothing, and we push U. Um, let's call this state P, 
and let's just call this state R. Now somehow you go from whatever, through all possible paths, whatever, you come out at the end. You come out to some state, let's say S, and because the first symbol pushed has to be the last symbol popped, you're going to pop the U. So you're going to, let's say you read Z, let's just call it Z. You pop some U and then you push nothing. And this is going to be Q. So this is some computation in a PDA, some subcomputation. You start from P, you end at Q, you go, there's going to be a first transition and there's going to be a last transition. Notice that we have to do it this way because the PDA, even though the PDA goes left to right, the CFG goes inside out. So instead of considering the first, the second, and the third kind of thing, for the design of the CFG, we're going to have to consider the first thing and the last thing because the CFG goes inside out. So we're going to consider the first thing and the last thing. So we pop, we push U on the first step, and the last step is we pop uh, U. But let's suppose the first symbol we read was an A in the, off the input, and the last symbol we read was a, was a Z off the input. The idea here is like if A, P, Q is supposed to produce all strings that begin with P, that go from state P to Q, empty stack to empty stack, R, there's some intermediary recursive copy. There's a recursive argument we have to make here. There's some intermediary thing going on here. We don't know what the path is, but we can define it recursively. We're, whatever is going on in this computation path is going from R with just U in its stack to S with just U in its stack, because the last thing popped is going to be U. But if a computation can go from R to S only with U in its stack, then the same computation can occur going from R to S with nothing in its stack. Does that make sense? If you can go, imagine you allocate an empty array, or you can allocate an array that just begins with an element that you ignore, right? Any computation that goes from R to S is never going to go below uh, this line, right? It's never going to pop the U out, because the last thing that happens is, the, is popping the U out by our assumption. So what this means is we can have the rule APQ goes to A R S Z. R S is a non-terminal to produce anything that brings R from an empty by, by our kind of inductive definition here. R A R S is a non-terminal to produce the strings that bring the PDA, it's supposed to, we'll prove it, bring the PDA from state R to state S, empty stack to empty stack. Here in our computation, it goes not empty stack to empty stack, but just with U in it. So we read an A off the input. That's the first thing we read. And the last thing we read is a Z off the input. So here, the first symbol produced has to be an A. The last symbol produced has to be a Z. And RS is going to produce whatever is intermediary in between there. This is the, the main idea behind um, the simulation argument. This is the, this is the whole idea. Now, what happens if the stack was empty? Like, um, let's suppose the stack was empty at some, some intermediary point. So what would that look like? Maybe it looks like the stack height goes like this. Right? So let's say you're at some state P and you end at state Q. And the stack happened to be emptied at some state, let's say R. So suppose stack. was emptied at a state R in between P, Q. So as you go from P to Q, somehow the computation empties itself. It, it, at R, the, you're, you're out of juice, right? Well, you can simply compose these, right? If you can go from P to Q, empty stack to empty stack, where the stack is empty at R, you can actually go from P to R, empty stack to empty stack, and then R to Q, empty stack to empty stack. So you can just consider this computation, like this one, then this computation, like this one, and then concatenate them. So we're going to have rules of the form A uh, P Q goes to A P R A R Q. If you can go from APR, empty stack to empty stack, and then ARQ, empty stack to empty stack, certainly you can go from APQ, empty stack to empty stack. So this should produce this. This is just trans, uh, sort of a transitivity kind of thing, right? 
certainly if you can go at all from P to R and R to Q, then you can go from P to Q, right? So this is the idea behind, this is basically the entire, uh, the, the real crux of the proof. And the intu intuition is much more valuable than the proof itself. So if you can understand how the simulation here is occurring, then that's really the, whole, the, you know, the heart of today, the, the heart of today's lecture. And if you notice that we did have to take advantage of the uh, kind of conditions that we made, these were all necessary for the, for, the, for the proof to be complete. Okay, I'm going to give you now the formal definition of uh, what is our intuitive idea here. So like, um, so given PDA, uh, we'll say the PDA is P, which is equal to, and what is the parts of the PDA? We're going to have a set of states. We're going to have an uh, input alphabet, a stack alphabet. Um, our transition function, that's the important part, a start state, and a set of final states. But as we've made our restriction, we allow this to be just a single uh, final state. Right? So we've made P nice. So P has the nice properties, so, which allows us to perform the simulation of a decider by a producer. So that's our PDA, and we want to construct G in the following way, and construct uh, C of G, G as uh, follows. And recall, what are the parts of the, of the C of G? It's going to be like B uh, sigma, looks like a U, B sigma, the set of rules or productions. We'll call these R, because P is the PDA, and then the start symbol. So... Um, uh, for each uh, p comma q, I'll say for all for all p comma q in uh, uh, every pair of states, uh, add uh, the non-terminal a. Uh, APQ to uh, a non at APQ as a non-terminal, right? Um, we're going to let the start state be a zero f, as we've said. So it's going to go from the start state to the final state. That's what this non-terminal represents. That's what the start state is. Um, then uh, for all uh, states in Q. Uh, APP is going to be what? We're going to add production what? So if APQ is supposed to represent all strings that can bring you from state P to state Q, empty stack to empty stack, what production would we add for APP? APP is supposed to produce all strings that can bring you from state P to state P, empty stack, empty stack. What strings can bring you from, straight, from state P to state P, empty stack, empty stack? Yeah, it's going to be just the empty string. And we add this sort of as a technicality, right? You need kind of like a base case when you do anything, right? So certainly it's true uh, if we're trying to follow our intuition. So we're just going to put it as, the def as, as, as part of our definition, right? The empty string certainly brings any state to itself, empty stack to empty stack. So certainly that's true. Um, then we're going to add, uh, for all triples, uh, Q, R, in Q, add a production uh, A, a P, Q, goes to A, P, R, A, R, Q. So we defined um, this, this scenario happens if the stack is empty at state R. But we don't know for all computations intermediary from P to Q when the stack is going to be emptied. So instead, we can just define the production for all pairs, all triples of states. And it turns out that when we perform a uh, production of a word, only the good rules are going to be used. That's what's going to end up happening. But we can define this, th these kinds of productions anyway. Um, and then finally. Uh, add rule 
uh, a p q goes to a uh, a r s z if uh, basically the previous structure e existed in uh, the PDA as we defined. So we go from state P, you read A off the input, uh, you pop nothing and you push some U. Uh, you go to some S, you read a Z off the input, uh, you pop U and you push nothing. Right. So if this kind of structure exists in the PDA, then add that as a production. Right. So basically, these rules are the ones that really encode the transitions uh, for us. That's really how the simulation occurs. And also, interestingly, it doesn't go left to right like uh, the PDA does. It does the first transition, then the last transition. And that's really how the recursive structure works to the CFG. So that's, that's the um, definition of G given P. So given P, we construct a grammar exactly like this, uh, like G. So now we need to prove the correctness, though. So we actually technically didn't prove the correctness of the last one, but it was kind of easy because it was a program. Given a CFG, we were able to produce a program P which simulates G. It literally just substitute. It just literally took the non. It took the non-terminal and substituted it with a non-deterministic choice it made. That was easy to do. Here, it's not obvious that this is correct. How do we know, for example, that G, G appears to simulate P? How do we know it decides exactly and only the strings G? Sometimes you can accidentally make G accept sigma star. And certainly, like, P is going to produce a subset of sigma star. P is going to decide a subset of sigma star. So certainly, every string in P is going to be produced by G. So then G would be, um, uh, everything produced by P would be in G. But uh, we want it only and exactly the things that are produced, accepted by P to be produced by G. We want this to be exact an exact correspondence. You know. So the way we're going to do that is uh, prove um, the following if and only if statement. So uh, A, P, Q produces some string X. Uh, this is going to be pr proved if and only if um, X brings uh, P from state uh, P empty stack. And I'll start abbreviating, abbreviating that as... Uh, Yes, because I'm going to write empty stack a lot. So APQ produces in some sequence of productions string X, if and only if X brings P from state P, lowercase p, empty stack, to uh, state Q, uh, empty stack. So if this is true, then the grammar produces exactly the strings that are decided by P, right? If we can prove this if and only if statement, then we've proven, uh, so like each direction is a containment basically of uh, the, the thing. So if, L, if LP is the strings decided by P, we want to prove the double containment, like LG. We want to prove that every string decided by P is going to be produced by G. And then we want to prove also that every string produced by G is going to be decided by P. That's the idea. So we'll, we're going to have to prove the if and only if statement uh, both ways. Let me just a second. So certainly, if we can prove this statement, then we've completed the proof.
So let's start with the uh, forward direction. So the forward direction is uh, assume that APQ produces some string x. Uh, we want to show that x brings uh, p from state p, and I'll put empty stack here in parentheses, to q, empty stack, right? So apq is producing non-deterministically some string x. We want to show that x brings the PDA from state p to q, basically. Um, what is the proof technique that we should use to show this? A contradiction. Assume, so how would a contradictory proof work? If A produces a string and it doesn't... Induction? Induction, <laughs> yeah, induction. Well, we have kind of an inductive definition. CFGs themselves are kind of inductive devices. So we're going to... I said this previously, but induction and recursion used to mean similar things. They, those words used to be conflated. Now we mean, they, now they mean different things. Uh, induction is kind of bottom up and recursion is kind of top down. So, but they, they're, they're a similar argument. Um, our recursive definition kind of naturally leads us to apply uh, an inductive definition. So we want to prove this and we're going to proceed by induction. So what's the, what are we inducting on though? This is not easy. I don't expect you guys to know this one or guess this one correctly. We're going to be inducting on the number of productions. So that's kind of the idea. That's going to be kind of the, 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 re, the, the power of induction here. Is like we're going to assume that it's going to be correct for all productions of length less than k. That allows us to apply a kind of recursive argument. And then we're going to show that it works for k plus 1. Productions of length k plus 1. First of all, we need a base case. Is that readable? OK, barely. Um, base case is going to be what? Uh, productions of length uh, zero. Um, I should say length one, right? You need to at least one production, right? A, uh, we're really inducting not on the number of productions, we can call it a derivation, right? How many times do you have to apply a substring replacement rule is, num is a derivation of a string. So, and we're not concerned with the intermediary working strings that still have non-terminals. How many derivations, how many sequences of productions of our grammars of length one produce a string? So you or um, consider all consider our grammar as defined. APQ goes to APR, ARQ, whatever, right? All these rules. How many productions of this grammar produce a string in one step? So you're allowed to only just do one production. You're only allowed to do, and this is not easy to do again. This is a very involved proof. This grammar only uh, consider all strings that can be produced by this grammar in one step. It's just the amount of it has, or like the amount of states it has? Let's we'll, we'll get to that part, that argument for later. But first, I'm just concerned, what strings does this grammar produce? Forget the PDA. Just look at the rules that it has, the productions it has. How many of these, which productions work in one step? Is it the second rule, S equals? It's actually going to be this one, right? So this production. Well, it's not even a production. That's just like the definition. This production has non-terminals. This production has a non-terminal. So these productions to produce a string are going to take at least two steps, maybe probably more, right? This is the only production that allows, uh, that produces a string in one step. Uh, APP goes to epsilon is the only 
uh, derivation to produce a string in one step. So we want to now show the statement. So we want to show that uh, it's true that the empty string being, brings the PDA from state P to state Q, empty stack to empty stack. But it's kind of obviously our base case here. It, APP does produce the empty string. And it is true that the empty string does take the PDA. Uh, it is true. The PDA, the, the, that uh, the empty string, empty string does take the PDA from P uh, empty stack to Q empty stack. I'm going to try the marker one more time. Uh, so the base case is done, right? Not, actually, it's surprisingly non-trivial base case. But it makes sense because this is the base case rule, right? If you consider, like, if you consider like going from state to state, like, a, like paths, you want the path of length zero. It's going to go from you to yourself. So obviously, the, 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 the rule applies. So what is our induction hypothesis here? It's going to be, what, we're going to actually use uh, strong induction here. So assume, assume, if a uh, pq a pq produces some string x in uh, less than k steps, so basically it applies the substring replacements of the context-free grammar less than some k times, uh, then x brings p from a p empty stack to q empty stack. Right, so that's our induction hypothesis. So it's it's, it's actually strong induction here because we're not we're not assuming k, but less than less than equal to k. Doesn't really matter. Um, so what what do we want to prove? So let's, let uh, let uh, a p q produce x uh, x in uh, k plus one uh, steps. Uh, we have uh, two cases. I kind of don't want to erase this nice this nice thing here, but I guess I, I guess I will. So uh, case one, our first production was of uh, the form uh, APQ produces, goes to A, A, R, S, Z. So now we're going to do both cases of like, uh, whether basically if the stack was empty intermediary. When you apply a sequence of production, so here APQ produces some string X in K plus one steps. Uh, the first production has to be one of, a, one of these kinds. It either has to be uh, one of the kinds of the rules that we've added, right? It has to either be um, this kind of production or this kind of production. That has to be the first step when you produce a string. So um, and we're concerned when, when, when APQ produces a string X in K plus one steps. So what we're going to say is like uh, X is equal to some AYZ uh, then, because if this was the first production, A was the first, is the first symbol of X, and then uh, Z was the last symbol of X uh, with uh, 
uh, ARS producing uh, that that middle string we denote as Y. So X, we broke up into some pieces, the first and last symbol. If this was the first rule, like a context-free grammar can't delete letters as it produces them, right? There's no way, you only can add more letters. Each step adds letters. So whatever the first, if the first production was this, then the first and last symbol of X are fixed. Uh, so let's just break up Y and consider uh, like a step down. Like Y is now produced by some intermediary variable, some intermediary thing, RS, right? But uh, if, if ARS uh, is produced by, if APQ produces uh, X in K plus one steps, if APQ produces X, in uh, k plus one steps, then uh, ARS produces y in uh, less than k steps. Why? If this produce takes k plus one steps, then you're not considering the first step. You're considering the next k plus the next k plus one minus one steps because you're considering the first step. Then ARS has to produce y in less than k steps. If ARS produces Y in less than K steps, we can apply the induction hypothesis. By the induction hypothesis, um, Y brings uh, P from uh, P empty stack to Q empty stack. So it brings it from state P with an empty stack to state Q with empty stack. That's what the string y does, right? But uh, we only add the rule, uh, but we only added the rule a p q goes to a a r s z if uh, you could go from p uh, to r to s to z, to, excuse me, to q. So another way to think of this is like y brings uh, a p from state p, not empty stack, but just u in stack, to q, uh, just u in stack, right? So what string y brings p from state uh, from state P with just U in its stack to state Q with just U in its stack. And we only added this rule if in the PDA, uh, we only added the rule APQ goes to A, A, R, S, Z um, if we had the structure that looks like this, right? So we read A off the input, uh, pop nothing, and push U. So this is going to be R, this is going to be P, it's going to be S. Uh, read Z off the input. Um, pop the U, push nothing. Q, right? Um, but if Y brings P from R to S with just U in its stack, then if this is the structure in the PDA, then certainly we go from P to Q uh, with what? Then, uh, then uh, A, Y, Z brings... Uh, P from state P empty stack to Q empty stack, right? So, but A, Y, Z is just X. So X equals A, Y, Z. Uh, so the, the condition is true. Recall we were trying to prove that uh, X by assumption is produced by the non-terminal APQ in K plus one steps. We wanted to show that it brings the PDA from state P to state Q, uh, empty stack to empty stack, and we've proven that. Right. So that's the first case of the first half of the proof. Case two, uh, our first production. Was of the form. Uh, 
um, APQ goes to APR, ARS, ARQ, right? So it was this, the, the rule of the second kind where you happen to be empty at state R. Um, so we want, uh, we want to assume like uh, um, APQ produces uh, string X in uh, K plus one steps, right? And if the first production of X was of this form, then we know then that um, X equals some UV uh, where um, APR produces a string U and ARQ produces some string uh, V, each in less than K uh, productions. I'll say steps. So if the first production was of the form APQ goes to APR ARQ, so it was of this kind of rule, then we apply the recursion now twice. This is going to produce some string in less than k steps. This is going to produce some string in less than k steps. Because this is the k plus one, th this is the first step of a sequence of k plus one steps. So what we can do now is because we can say APR produces some u, ARQ produces some b, but these all apply in less than, uh, k, less than k steps. So by the induction hypothesis, uh, we know that uh, u brings uh, the PDAP from P empty stack to R empty stack. Uh, v brings uh, the PDAP from uh, state R empty stack to uh, Q empty stack. Right? So U brings the PDA from P to R, empty stack, empty stack. The string V brings the PDA from R to Q, empty stack, empty stack. So certainly, uh, UV equals X brings uh, the PDA P from P empty stack to uh, R empty stack to Q empty stack. So it's certainly, if you can go from P to R to Q, you certainly go P to Q. So certainly, uh, this, this is now proven. So the string X does, uh, if we had a production of the second kind, the, the string X does bring uh, the PDA from P to Q, empty stack to empty stack. So we finished the first half of this proof, right? So we've proven one way of this thing. If this, any string produced by this grammar will be uh, accepted by the PDA, right? Now we need to prove that any string uh, accepted by this PDA must be produced by this grammar to show that these two exactly line up. I think we're going to do it. Uh, I guess I'll do it over here. Yes? What's that word um, below case two? Assume. OK. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, so like the gist of the proof is just that like if you start off with something, like you, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's just saying like, it can produce the ends in one step, and then it can produce the middle and the remaining Right, so the induction steps. works the same way as the, recurs the recursive structure of the grammar inside out. If something takes k plus 1, we assume some, that everything's work, all productions of length k are correct, and then we want to show it's true for k plus 1. So we, take the k, we look at a production of length k plus 1, and then we back step one step, and we look at what happens. So the, k, the case production is true, though, by the induction hypothesis. So then the next step has to be true, certainly. OK. Right. So induction is actually very natural for these kind of re recursive structures all the time, right? So we consider uh, that it's true for, the, for all productions of length k. Then we show it has to be true for k plus 1.
Again, very involved. Uh, overly technical proof. Won't be on the exam. Oh my god, twice. Is there no way to just keep them on? No, I thought about it. I looked it up. It's, it's just, uh, I'm just going to deal with it. So now we're going to prove the other direction. Um, let's see the cameras line up. Oh, wait, what the heck? Okay. So the other prediction is uh, if a P uh, brings, uh, no, if uh, X, some string brings a P from a state uh, P uh, empty stack to Q uh, empty stack, then uh, APQ must produce X. That's what we want to prove the other way. So if X brings P from P to Q, then the non-terminal APQ must produce string X. What is, we're going to proceed by induction again. What are we inducting on? Last time we inducted on the number of productions. So we showed K plus one productions, assuming K, uh, assuming the property was true for productions of length less than or equal to K. I'm sure it must be true for productions of length K plus one. What would we be inducting on here? Again, not an easy question. Wait, so we're proving that context-free languages will produce, like, a PDA for it, or? We're, we did that last time. We're showing that every PDA has a context-free grammar to do exactly what the PDA does. The grammar simulates the PDA in some sense. And now we're doing the second half of the if and only if direction. So we want to show. Uh, like of the grammar as we've defined, if X brings the PDA, assume that X uh, works internally in the PDA from P to Q, and then you know it's going to go from start to end as well. That APQ uh, produces string X. So this specific PDA, we've this specific grammar we've defined. Given a, some fixed PDA, we give a fixed grammar uh, that the if the string does is accepted by the PDA, we want to now prove in this step that it must be produced by the grammar. That's the force forcing argument here. What would we perform the induction on? Again, not expecting you to get this. Would this be like strings of like length, like some length? You know, so if you consider strings of a certain length, at each step the PDA mm, kind of like in a DF, when you do proofs with DFAs, you have to kind of do the string length. But a PDA is allowed to, an interface as well, allowed to not look at the input at certain steps. So just generalizing that, we want to induct on the number of computation steps of the PDA. So the, the number, consider that the, the PDA is correct on like k, all computations of length less than k. We want to show it's correct on all computations steps of length k plus 1. And at each step, it may read a string off the, it may read a symbol off the input, or it may not. So considering the steps is kind of like considering the string, except it's allowed to... Uh, not yeah, read. yeah. There's a lot to not read some of the input. So we're going to induct on uh, the number of uh, steps that the computation takes. So our base case here. Previously, our base case was one production, but here our base case is going to be uh, computations of length one. Excuse me, computations of length zero. So consider a PDA that has computations of length zero. Any computation of length zero doesn't have time to read the input, right? It doesn't have time to move any states, and it doesn't have time uh, to read the input, right? So no time to switch states. So consider all x such that um, APP produces uh, some string X. So but if we any computation of length zero also has no time to read the input. So 
So it can only be the case that x is the empty string. Um, but we have production. Uh, APP does produce uh, the empty string. So the base case holds, right? We wanted to show that APP must produce all strings. If X brings P from P to P, then it must be produced by the grammar from APP, and we've shown that to be true, just because the base case is kind of trivial here. Um, what's our induction hypothesis? Assume um, uh, if uh, x brings a p from a lowercase p empty stack uh, to a lowercase q empty stack in less than equal to k uh, computation steps, Uh, then uh, APQ must produce uh, X, right? So now we're consider all the strings that take you from one state to another as if they're like paths uh, through the through the PDA itself. But what you have this, of course, you have this stack you can push and pop from. Um, if the computation takes less than k steps to go from uh, P to Q, then we may assume by the induction hypothesis that APQ produces that string. So again, unfortunately, we have uh, two cases. So um, suppose uh, x brings p uh, from p empty stack to q empty stack in uh, k plus 1 computation steps. Uh, we want to show that APQ must also produce X, right? So we have two cases. Uh, case one, and these are going to basically correspond. We're basically doing the proof. Even though the proof has to be an if and only if, it has to go both ways, the proof structure is going to be quite similar. I mean, you go through a front door, you, can go, you go back through the same door, basically. So the two cases for this conditional it's going to be this basically the same as the two cases we had for grammar. So uh, the case one is going to be like the stack was only empty and uh, at the beginning and end. The stack was only empty at the beginning uh, and the end. So no point between the computation that x brings from p to q, empty stack to empty stack, was there an intermediary point that um, the stack was empty. Uh, so uh, the first symbol pushed. Must be. Or the last symbol popped. Uh, so our PDA may, may look like you go from some state P, you read some symbol A, uh, you pop nothing, you push some symbol U, you go to some state R. Uh, from R, you go to some state S. Uh, from S, you read Z off the input, uh, you pop the U, and then you push nothing, because we're assuming that's the last, the first thing pushes the last thing popped, and then you end up at state Q. All right? Um, 
So the first symbol red was, let's suppose it was an A, and the last symbol red was some Z, where X is the string that takes you from P to Q. Uh, so then we can say like, um, X equals A, Y, Z, uh, where A is the first symbol red of X, and Z is the last symbol red of X. Uh, so Y takes P, From P, uh, Y takes the PDA capital P from P with just U in stack to uh, Q uh, to Q just U. In stack. But if Y can bring the PDA from P to Q, just you in the stack, just you in the stack, uh, it can bring, uh, it can, the same Y can bring P from R to S with empty stack to empty stack. So, uh, P from P empty stack to Q empty stack. Uh, by the induction hypothesis, this, if this computation takes k plus 1 steps, this is a step, this is a step, this computation from R to S on Y takes k minus 1 steps. So we can apply the induction hypothesis. By the induction hypothesis, then, ARS must produce um, Y. Uh, but we have production. Notice that we have, if ARS produces Y, then certainly, by the way we've had our grammar set up, then A, P, Q uh, produces A, A, R, S, a Z. Excuse me, this should be an arrow. Um, where should I write this? So certainly, A, P, Q uh, does produce A, A, Y, Z, which is equal to X. I'm not sure you can see that. But we assumed that X brings P from state P to Q, empty stack to empty stack. Uh, and now we've proven that APQ must also produce the string uh, X. So case two. Uh, um, uh, the stack was empty in some middle point. Empty. Somewhere between a P and Q. Uh, suppose at some state uh, R. So then, like X. By assumption is going to X brings the PDA P by assumption from uh, P empty stack to Q empty stack in K plus one steps. Uh, so X is equal to some U V, um, where U brings uh, P from uh, P empty stack to R empty stack. V brings uh, P from uh, R empty stack to uh, B empty stack, excuse me, from to Q empty stack. Um, by the induction hypothesis, we know then that APQ, APR must produce uh, U and A, R, Q must produce uh, B. But we have, but we have production A, um, P, R, excuse me, A, P, Q uh, goes to A, P, R, A, R, Q, right, defined in our grammar. So we see then that A, uh, P, Q produces 
in one step, APR, ARQ, which produces in some number of steps, a UV, which is just equal to X. So we see then that APQ produces X. Assuming that uh, X um, takes P from state P to Q in K plus one computation steps, we've now proven that APQ, the non-terminal, must produce string X. So very involved proof, very uh, kind of a lot going on, but we can now conclude. We've, uh, we, we have proven this, the correctness of our construction, and we've done the if and only if. So now we can finally say that if every language that is decidable by a PDA, there exists a CFG. This is the worst marker. There exists a CFG to produce that language. We previously... Um, We previously uh, produced the reverse containment. So now we can finally say that uh, L uh, PDA is equal to uh, L CFG. These two classes of languages produce exactly and only the same languages. Anything that has a CFG, any grammar that any language that has a CFG for it also happens to have a PDA. So these two, these two uh, devices correspond exactly to the same class of languages. Okay?